Okay, this is take take two, um, the Ray Lingwall uh, history, take two. Ray, we got up to uh, the period just before World War II, 1939. Um, what did you do then? You, you, you finished school in 39, and then what? You finished went, school in 39. Went to work. Uh, went to work. What did you do? I was working as a clerk with uh, Commercial Steels and Forge Company. Right. Where was that? At, uh, just down from Redford, New South Wales. What sort of work was it? Oh, it was in a, a planner's office. Uh, we used to make aeroplane parts and, well, it turned out uh, fuses for the uh, bombs and aeroplane parts and they shifted uh, from uh, Redfern out to uh, Lidcombe and it turned into a full wartime uh, plant. So you were with, with that firm until you went into the army, I suppose? Well, when I was working with him, I wasn't allowed to go into the army because it was a uh, reserved industry. And uh, when the war got serious, they let me go into the army. Right. And then I went in. That when, was 1940. When was that? 1942. 42? Yes. And what was, tell me about that. Well, I just went into the army. And, um, and who were you with? What group? Uh, well, I finished up in uh, Fortress Siggs, Akak on Fortress Siggs. Uh, when we went away to New Guinea, that was what uh, we joined the uh, 19th LFC as the. Uh, Akak Fortress Six Company, and we did uh, a couple of years up in the islands. What age were you when you went into the army? Um, Twenty-two, was it? About yeah, twenty. Twenty. And how long? What sort of? Where did you do your training? What? what uh, North the Head. When you went into the army, what happened? Well, they put me over to North Head to do my ordinary training, and uh, I then went to. Uh, a test to see what they'd put me as, and they put me, I passed the test very high and 98%, and they gave me in the, put me into the sig signals. And I thought I'd be a clever fella like they thought I should get cipher because I was 98% of a pass, and they put me into linesman, <laughs> climbing up and down poles. So the test didn't make any difference. I still did the hard work. And, uh, I went in as a private, got the rank of corporal, came back to private when I got out of the army. Of course, when we were up in the islands, there was no promotions in the signals, uh, and that's why I didn't get promoted. Uh, that's one of the reasons. But we were only a forward unit. There was only 10 of us in our unit, and we were mostly forward, so, and I was in charge, corporal. So it wasn't... Uh, uh, wasn't much opportunity for promotion because we were winning the war then. After the, after a while, we were losing the war when we got there. But uh, when, we, did you, when did you arrive? Oh, uh, when the Japanese were at the bottom of the Kokoda Trail in Port Moresby. We were on a ship just about to land and it was so dangerous they reckoned that you know, they were going to take Port Moresby so they weren't going to let us get off the ship. But then they let us off the ship and uh, we camped uh, on our palliasses in the grass, long grass, about five miles out of Moresby uh, and about three miles from the Japanese, which was very frightening. And I was on picket duty. And the first night I was on picket duty, when the Japs were about three miles away, I saw them all coming at me, all the torches. I know it's silly to think they had torches, and hundreds of thousands of torches coming at me. So I didn't know what to do. If I fired, they'd kill me, and I'd kill the other Japs that were in the group. So I didn't fire, I just waited. And it turned out they weren't Japanese, they were fireflies. That was my first attempt. First time I ever seen a firefly. 
I was very pleased to see them. I thought they were Japanese. Two years later, we were up in a, further up on the Emiru Island, way up near the Admiralty Islands, and a, the war was much better in our favour then, and the Japanese were flying past in boats and trying to get back somewhere. And a gr new group come onto our island, a New Zealand group, and they start to fire rifle shots at the boats going past, which they thought were boats with torches on. And I just said to them, oh, don't be silly chaps. I said, they're only fireflies. <laughs> with all my experience of two years, I knew what a firefly was, but they didn't. They were new up in the islands, and they thought they were the Japanese boats, but it, uh, I fixed them up. Then we came home. You came home early, did you? Hmm? You came home early. No, I came home late. I came home after, after the war finished. Yes. I think the war finished in August, and I came home in October. And Arthur Morris must have came home later. Yes. But, uh, I came home just before the cricket season started, and I I had special leave because I had a lot of leave due to me, so I had special leave. And my unit went down to Victoria, and I stayed in for my leave in Sydney. And when I finished the leave and came back, I wasn't allowed to re rejoin my unit in Victoria because no one's allowed out to, to go to another state. And they put me in a staging camp. The next day, I was put on a two years draft to Japan. And uh, it was Friday, and I had to leave on Monday, and no leave. So I took leave and arranged a <laughs> compassionate transfer. <laughs> I didn't have enough points to get out of the army because I had 124 points, and to get out of the army, you had to have 125. And I didn't get out, and uh, but I managed to get a compassionate transfer from the uh, unit going to Japan for two years, which was after the war, and uh, it upset my cricket a little bit, so I was lucky enough to get the transfer. Taking a big slug out of it, wasn't it? Yes. would have been two years without any cricket. You never know where you would have been. No, that's right. You played... Um some cricket, you didn't play a shield game until your first shield game was after the war, but you played, what did you play from that period before, between uh, the, the outbreak of war in 39 when you left school, well, and you went to, uh, you actually went away to New Guinea? Yeah, well, before the Japanese, they came into the war on the 8th of December in Australia, uh, we had played a uh, cricket match against Queensland in October or November uh, against Queensland, which wasn't a Sheffield Shield. They didn't call it Sheffield Shield. It was a uh, for war bonds. It was in Brisbane in 1941. And then we were getting picked to go, the team was getting picked to go to South Australia and Victoria. But then the Japanese came into the war and stopped all the cricket. And so we didn't play any more cricket until the 1945 after the war. Right. It's interesting to see that in this uh, cricket yearbook, 48-49, that um, the last game that's recorded there was February 1941, New, uh, South Australia and New South Wales. So you're talking now about uh, the summer of 41, 42, aren't you? I mean, yeah, well, I'm talking about, about October. 1941, which was after the February, and uh, it wasn't a Sheffield Shield match though. It was a for war bonds. And during your period in New Guinea, you had some problem with uh, malaria type disease or dengue fever, or uh, well, you didn't, you didn't get out of that period scot free, did you? As far as you know. Well, I had dengue four times, which is very sickening disease uh, you think you're going to die you get a four days fever and it takes a little bit while to, but four days are very serious and uh, I had that four times in the two or three years two years I was up there and I had malaria I thought I had malaria about three or four times which wasn't as bad as the dengue and I had tonsillitis I went to hospital with tonsillitis there, and they couldn't take the tonsils out because the uh, hospital wasn't uh, 
was it was a field hospital. It wasn't advanced enough to take the tonsils out, so they, I didn't get them out. I got them out in about two years later, 1947-48. Before I toured England, 1948, I got the tonsils out then. And I started to drink then, and my weight went on, and I blamed the tonsils. And what other sorts of uh, sport did you manage to squeeze in during your time in the army? Well, in the army we played uh, cricket and football in New Guinea. Uh, not very much cricket, uh, not very advanced cricket. We only picked up matches against each other, but it wasn't serious. So. But we played serious football. Uh, again, you know, the football was more important to soldiers than the cricket. And I played football up there, which was very hard uh, in the heat over 100 degrees. And uh, we enjoyed it. And uh, we didn't play all that much. That was only when we had spare time doing nothing uh, serious. We had to leave or something like that. We played uh, football and cricket. I think you'd find it in, wherever the, you get the army chaps, they'll play football and cricket anywhere. Did you get to play any baseball at all? Because there were Americans on that part of the world at that time. Well, I played softball. Uh, as at Arthur Morris mentioned, we played a softball game up there, and we played softball uh, against the Yanks when I was up there, but they were a bit too good for us. Uh, I was picked in a baseball side, Australia played the Yanks, but I was picked in it as a reserve, so I didn't get a game. But that would have been an honour. I, I have never played baseball, and I was picked as a reserve on my reputation at softball. But as I say, I didn't get a game, and the Yanks beat us 13 to nil. They had a very good side, they had all the stars, and they flew them in from uh, this match I was supposed to play in. They flew them in from all over the islands because the Australian team had beaten them the year a week, a couple of weeks beforehand, and they weren't going to get beat the second time. They flew the stars in. They were very great players. So the Maggio and a few other stars were there. Where was that? Uh, I think that was it. Yes, it was one of those places, but I don't know which one it was. I think it was uh, probably Lay. I'm not sure. Buna Lay or wasn't Finch Harbour. Uh, it would have been uh, yeah, it would have been Lay, I think. When the uh, when the war finished, when when did you return to Australia, and how did you come back? Well, we're at Emeru Island, which is only a little island, and we were associated with the uh, Americans. We had uh, only 10 of us there and with another group of uh, army ACAC people. And uh, we were hard, found it hard to get back because of no transport. And no planes were coming into, Australian planes weren't coming in to pick us up. And uh, so we were left there for a couple of months waiting to get a plane back. And uh, I just came back by myself. Uh, to Bougainville and stayed there for about two or three days and uh, had my first drink there because when I got there a, a friend of mine was there, Doug McRitchie, who I knew very well, he was a great footballer and uh, we played football up in the islands together and he said, have you got any beer on your playbook? I said, I don't know, I don't drink. And he said, good. It was your pay book, and he took my pay book and he got 120 bottles because I hadn't had a drink for the, all the time I was up there. And I think it was two or three bottles a week they allowed. So they bought all the beer and they drank it all, and I didn't have any. And right towards the end, they insisted I have a drink because I gave them the beer for nothing. I didn't charge them for it, and which was at a, a, a going rate of about a shilling a bottle. I should have got a lot of money. And I. They made me drink a beer and I went to bed. I had three beers and went to bed. The first time I had a drink. And that night the volcano went up and threw everyone out of bed and there was panic because the lava was coming down the 
mountain side and it was only just a little way away. But I was thrown out of bed and seeing I had a drink, I thought it was through the beer that I was thrown out of bed and I got back into bed. I was the only one in bed, all the others were panicking outside. And they said to me when I woke up next day, where have you been? I said, I've been asleep. They said, you must be brave. And I thought it was the beer, so I didn't know it was, I was brave through the, that I didn't take, you know, through the lava coming down the mountain. Anyhow, it stopped and it didn't blow up properly. When did you come back to Australia? Well, that was about the uh, same time and I got a plane a couple of days later. Flew back. Uh, I don't think we did. I don't know. I right did. Uh, we had one trip back by ship, so I think that was it. Yes, when I went on leave from the islands, I flew on Christmas Day. But uh, then we came back by a ship. I forget the name of the ship, but it was one of our coastal. You got back into here? We got back to uh, Sydney. Uh, Time for you to uh, get some practice with what the play, you play with St George? Oh yes, I played it. It was about I, sometime. I think the first uh, state match was about October, and I, it was just a couple of weeks before that that I got back home. I just had one match, I think, and then got in the state side to go to. So you were picked Queensland to go straight into that first Shield match, which was forty-five Brisbane, November nineteen forty-five. November. Yeah. What can you remember about that match? Uh, nothing at the moment. <laughs> Hey, if you tell me what happened, I'll tell you what happened. Well, New South Wales uh, batted first. Sid Barnes made 200. Yes, I remember that, and I batted with him at the end. You were not out 12. Total of 338, and there were people in the side like Bill Alley, who opened. Crossan, Donaldson, Saggers, Maroney, O'Brien, Woolmer. Wormsley, Tosh Yes, I remember the match now. Your I... first wicket seems to have been a man called Carrigan. Yes. by Lindwell for North. That's right, I remember that. And your second and only other wicket in that inning, 17 overs and three balls, no maidens, two for 57. There's a man who, according to the scorecard, was number 10, G. Lockie, caught by Crossan off your bowling for 20. Yes. Well, that was, I think, a good batting wicket. You crashed in the second innings for 141. Did we? Yeah. Top scorer was uh, Barnes again, 25. Colin McCool took six for 36. You made four. And... Queensland won the match by four wickets because they made 270 for six wickets in the second innings. You got Cook out for two. It was your only wicket, one for four, you got ten wickets. Well, that's why I don't remember the match. We got defeated. It wasn't a very memorable match. No. As far as you were concerned. Well, as I, I wouldn't have been in very good condition for cricket because uh, I didn't. I don't know if I had a match before we went up there or not, but it was very late. I got back uh, before that match started. It was only a week or two, so I hadn't played much cricket. What can you remember about that uh, that year? That, that right after the war, what was it like? There must have been a lot of lot of people very thrilled to be alive, I suppose. And the war to be over. And what was life like? Well, to get out of the army was wonderful to finish up in the islands. The islands were not the greatest place to be for two years or so. And uh, to get back into uh, civilian life was wonderful. But uh, we had uh, the trip after the cricket. Well, the trip and we, the cricket season was wonderful because we stayed in hotels after being in a tent. Not that the hotels were that good anyhow. <laughs> They weren't as good as they are now, but they were better than what we were used to, and the food was much better. And uh, it was wonderful to travel around Australia, places I'd never been before in my life, and uh, it started something for me that I have been doing ever since, travelling, playing cricket. And it's a wonderful life. I remember that, that year, the cricket, I got 100. 
That's what I remember, being a batsman. Tell me about that. Well, I got 100 against Queensland. 134 not out, I think it was. I know it was. And I was thrilled. That was before we got picked to go to New Zealand. And by getting that, I, I think that would have been a, assured me of a place to go to New Zealand as a batsman. But it didn't do any good because I still went in very low down the order. That was at Sydney? Yes. December 31st, 1945, January 1, 2, 3, 46. And? 134 not out. That's right. Your first first class 100. Would have batted with, um, I guess, people like James, Greaves, Gulliver, O'Reilly, Toshak. Ronnie James made 108. Sagas yeah, 43. I I think I batted with James a bit. You must have seen the ball pretty well. Well, I, I, I always thought I was a batsman in those days. Uh, and uh, I think that was my idea to be an all-rounder. So I was very pleased I got the runs. And I did bat fairly well, I think. Well, it was a good match for New South Wales because you won that by an innings in 115, so that was another reason for you to remember it. And you took one wicket in, your first, in the first innings and three in the second. And in, you bowled Don Talon in the first innings. And you, among your wickets was Billy Brown, Colin McCool, and there must have been one other, Mick Raymer. Mick, uh, all good batsmen. All good batsmen. <laughs> then you played the services team. In 1946, New South Wales won that fairly comprehensively, but it was the first time you came up against uh, Keith Miller. Yes. Uh, he got a beautiful hundred. I think O'Reilly was playing with us. He bowled very well and Keith Miller batted very well. He, he got a hundred and eight or nine or something. And uh, first time I met him, I didn't uh, mix with him very well that trip because he was against me. But uh, when we went to New Zealand together, we became friendly and sometimes roommates. And I think we've been friendly ever since. He rang me about two days ago, so he's back from England, got the shingles. But uh, he batted beautifully. He was a great bat, Keith Miller, in the early days. Uh, when he played Victoria against New South Wales, he was one of the star batsmen all the time. And it's only when he came to New South Wales and bowled a little bit more and played for Australia and bowled a bit more that uh, his batting went off a little bit. He's still a good batsman, but he wasn't as great as he was in the first couple of years I knew him play. He was uh, one of the star batsmen of the Australian. It was hard to bowl against, did you find him difficult to bowl against? Well, he was hard to bowl against because he, he, he wouldn't defend very much. He played strokes all the time and uh, he had to tie him down by good balls. And uh, if the wicket wasn't uh, helping, uh, it's very hard to bowl a good ball. So he was uh, always on the attack. and. Uh, he hit the ball very hard. But uh, I didn't bother against him. He came to play with us then, so... It helped didn't... a bit, did it? To put him on your side <laughs> rather than against him. But his batting went off then. <laughs> yes. No, he was a great player. And, right, that, that, um, that match against the services side also saw you playing against a man called Carmody, who, whose field or they called it the Carmody Field, was, uh, some say, was first employed, uh, especially for you. Was that so? I mean, did, did that by design or was that by accident? Well, he was against us. He employed the field for his side. Oh, right. Well, sorry. Yeah. yeah he played true. with us. No, no, no. No, Carmody was playing with the services side. DK Carmody, bowled by Toshek, 14, Stump Sagers, bowled O'Reilly, but... I oh, know he so played for New South Wales. Yeah, he played for New South Wales, but then he went to Perth, and I don't know where he started at Carmody Field. I think he might have started down in Perth. 
So yeah. whenever you employed sort of five slips, two galleys, and a couple of leg slips, it was called a galley field. You know, had I think it was those days, yes, but I don't think he was with us. I think he was against us then. Right. He played for New South Wales when he went to Western Australia. Uh, he used to have the two leg slips and uh, fives. I think that's right, seven, two or nine, one of ten, eleven, yeah. Seven on the off and two on the on. Yes. Yeah. Or the other way, six and six and three. Six and three, I think. Six and three. Yes, six and three. Two fine leg slips and five slips. And uh, mid on and mid off, bowler and batsman. Your first five wicket haul was um, against South Australia at Sydney, early, sorry, late January 46 when New South Wales won by an innings in 51, you took five for 42 in the first innings, four for 35 in the second. Do you remember much of that? I remember it. Uh, naturally, every time you get wickets, you don't forget. But uh, I think the wicket was, uh, I think there was a second innings, there was a strong gale blowing a southerly. And I, Normally bowled the northern end, but uh, it was a southerly, so I went southern end, and I think that was uh, made it a bit quick, the wicket. And you picked up four for 35. But the first innings, I think, I don't know for sure whether the first innings was a southerly too, but I know I bowled that match, I bowled from the southern end. You dismissed Cray, Close, Ron Hammonds, Phil Ridings, and F.C. Bennett. They were your first one, two, three... Four, five, six. Those five came out of the first six in the batting order. And you got Craig, Hammonds, Bennett, and Noblet in the second innings. And your first test, of course, was played in New Zealand. What was that tour like? Was well, it was a very good tour. It was uh, my first tour, naturally, and I enjoyed it, but uh, I didn't get much bowling except uh, I think I bowled in Canterbury against Canterbury. Uh, that's about a few overs there, but we had Koshak and uh, O'Reilly, McCool, and uh, they used to get most of the wickets and most of the bowling. It wasn't a, a, a hard trip for me, but in the test match especially, it was a wet wicket, and I only bowled a few overs just to get Eight the shine off. First and nine and second. To get the shine off the ball, and <laughs> O'Reilly and Toshak and McCool came on. Can you remember your first test wicket? A chap called McDonald. Both innings, I got him out. I only got one wicket each innings, and he's. He made four in the first innings and one in the second. Yeah, he's my friend. I got him out both innings. He was the only fellow that was. Uh, <laughs> I remember his name. Can you remember your first innings in a test match? Yes, I can. We were four for 200, four, five for 200 or something, and uh, it was a wet wicket. The rain started to fall, and we lost four quick wickets, uh, or three quick wickets, I forget which. And I was walking out to go into bat, and Billy Brown, who was captain, he was walking out alongside me towards the field, and I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to close. I said, good. And I turned around to go back. He said, no, he said, there's two balls left. I want you to hit two sixes. So as a result, I hit one straight up in the air and got caught for a duck. My first test match. Very poor way to go into bat. Caught Anderson, bowled Cowie, no score. Yeah, I scored a point trying to hit a six over straight drive. Went right up in the air. That was in, what, April? Of, uh, end of March. 1940. April of 1946. Six. That was my first batting duck on a test match. But as I say, it was uh, under pressure because I had to hit two sixes and two balls. So there's an excuse for that. Won't hold me. That's a good, good point for us to stop there, I think, right? Because that tape's almost, it's almost out. Finished? Yep. You can relax.